this is a mouthful of a topic. Why are we talking about diversity and inclusion at an Agile conference? Wow, big topic. Uh, welcome, welcome. It is my pleasure to be able to speak to you today, but who am I? I am Dana. Dana the trainer is what they call me. It rhymes. It's amazing. It's my whole brand. I love it. Uh, and uh, if you saw my talk yesterday, you might be a little bit confused about why I'm talking about diversity and agile today. So please let me explain. I am a trainer, a facilitator, and a coach in the world of agile, but I am also a trainer, facilitator, and coach in the world of diversity and inclusion. And you might be thinking, hold up a minute, Dana, those two things don't go together. That sounds a little bit weird, agile and diversity, but it will make sense when I tell you my origin story. So when I moved to the UK many, many years ago, I started my career in big four consultancy. I was client facing, I worked in tech, hence all of the agile stuff, right? That makes sense. But when I was in that role, I was a minority. I am black, guys, I think you can tell that, right? I'm a woman, an immigrant, and I was married, and I'll tell you why that was a whole thing. Uh, and you like dogs. On. And I like dogs. Does that put me in the minority? No, that's a majority thing. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it was the first time in my life that I had really ever been a minority because in Trinidad, pretty much everyone is like me and all blended, right? So I think it turned on my activist gene. So I joined every woman in STEM, woman in tech group that I could, and I volunteered for stuff, and I ran programs aimed at helping more women especially those from underprivileged backgrounds, joined the firm, and I was tireless until one day an opportunity came to move to learning and development, and I did. And I was still required to teach technical courses and keep one foot in the business, but I got to play around more and explore my diversity and inclusion side. So I lived in both worlds, and I continue to do that today because it's fun and I studied really hard to get all my agile qualifications and why should I give that up? And it's just good to be able to do both. And joining me today is my colleague and friend. Yes, Fiona, I did use the F word, we're friends now. Um, she is an experienced facilitator and she is equally as passionate about diversity and inclusion as I am. She puts it at the center of her work in management, leadership and wellness. Uh, we actually met when she invited me to be part of a panel uh, that was about diversity and inclusion. She's going to bring extra warmth to our discussions, share some of her experience and opinions. She's going to be watching to make sure I don't miss anything. And when I start going on crazy rants, she might rein me in a little. And just so you know, we also have Adrian and Sharon on with us today as producers and thank you to them in advance. If things go smoothly, it's totally me. If things don't go smoothly, it is on them, guys, just so you know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Okay, so let's, let's start here. Uh, so we're clear going into the discussion. Uh, what we mean by diversity and inclusion, and let's start with diversity first, right? So we all know people are unique. Diversity is really any dimension that we can use to differentiate people and groups from each other. So it's about respecting and appreciating what makes people different. And so what are those things that make people different? That's a great question. And it's one that I'm going to ask you. And the reason why I'm asking you is because we are all human beings, we are all fallible, and sometimes we think only about the diversity that affects us, right? So we only see and notice and advocate for the things that affect us or that we fit into. And it's good to have a reminder of the other things that are out there, right? So uh, let's think about those things that create differences between people. And I'm going to ask you to start typing them into the chat. Uh, and you might be feeling nervous about that and judged. Please don't. I'm going to have, a, Fee, can you go first? Can you type something in? What, what might be one of those differences that contribute to diversity? 
Perfect, right? Yep, so we're going for it. So our backgrounds, how and where we grew up, age, socioeconomic backgrounds, education, that's true. Scott, is this is with Gray and <laughs> Oh my God, this is already going inappropriate. Okay, so like personality, FBTI, race and ethnicity, disabilities, uh, gender, Scott has written in ginger in the middle of the chat, right? Okay. Your cognitive style completely. Let's see if anyone, yep. Sexual orientation, body size, great. Yeah. So dyslexia and, and, uh, other things like it is what kicks off the discussion about neurodiversity exactly yep which is the recognition of all those kinds of qualities <laughs> okay alcohol consumption i'm laughing because i actually have like a little section where i talk about that today which is going to seem pretty random uh but we will get there Guys, there are also things that people, religion, great, where we're from, our culture. People also forget things like marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, uh, and whether or not you have children, language, exactly. Right, so religion and lack thereof, exactly. So you guys, you're clear, you know what we're talking about when we talk about diversity. So now uh, let's tackle inclusion. A little bit. Oh, Antoinette is sharing that there was a time when a person felt outside of their group because they didn't consume alcohol. And literally, that is what I am going to mention later. Because when I first moved to the UK and started my career, I was that person. I'm, I'm not anymore. But yeah, it, there was a moment, right? So let's talk about inclusion. So recognizing the things that make us different and knowing those things is great. Uh, but once we shine a light on those differences, are the people who have those differences going to be culturally and socially accepted and welcome? Will they be treated as equals, right? Inclusion is about a sense of belonging. Inclusive cultures make people feel valued for who they are they feel engaged, they feel like they're contributing to the success of a team or organization. And that's really important because when people feel valued, they can function at their full capacity when they feel included. So I'm gonna start off with my first poll of the day. Guys, all of my polls today are going to be anonymous. So even if there's right answer, wrong answer, you don't have to worry about it. The answer that you put in, only you will know, right? Uh, the first poll is about whether or not you currently feel included at work. I've just launched it. Guys, if you don't see the poll, if you're on Zoom web, you can't see the poll, then uh, the options are like always, most of the time, sometimes, rarely, or no, not at all. So uh, let, let's see where we land. See, the thing that's really interesting about inclusion is that you can ask people who are in the same team, in the same group, this question, right? Uh, and they might give you a totally different answer depending on whether they are part of the in-group and whether they are part of the out-group, right? So someone on the same team could be having a completely different experience, even though it's the same space that we're talking about, right? So uh, most of the time was the most popular answer for this poll, which is great news. We had some sometimes was the second most popular answer. Uh, yes, then yes, always, then rarely or not very often, okay? So here's the thing about that. We're gonna be talking today about what we can do to help boost those numbers, bump those numbers up, because the truth is, that companies that value diversity and inclusion build better products and are more profitable than those who don't. And that is not from the book of Dana. That is actually some fact. There is a McKinsey 
study uh, that proves it. They published this white paper called Delivering Through Diversity. They spoke to over a thousand companies and these 1000 companies covered 12 nations of the world on every continent. So it was quite a considerable study. Uh, it is from 2018, right? Oh, I'm, I'm getting asked for a link for the McKinsey survey. I will make sure that I make it available to Jose. Uh, and if there's time at the end, I might be able to post it into the chat. I have a link to it because uh, I refer to this uh, study all of the time. I think it's really interesting as well. So this report that McKinsey did showed that where you have gender diversity in management positions in a company, it increases profitability by 21%. So if you have a gender mix in management, and this was mid-level management, there was a 21% increase in profits. Um, what was also really interesting is that companies with more culturally, so cultural and ethnic diversity, were 33% more likely, so even wider range to see increases in profitability, right? Now, what's funny is that this was just at the employee level, but if you take it, that discussion about ethnicity and cultural differences to looking at board level, uh, there was a 43% increase in profitability if your board was more diverse culturally and uh, in terms of ethnicity, which I found was really interesting. And Marco is saying, uh, D didn't McKinsey report that DNI was one of the first areas to lose funding as a result of COVID-19? That was actually true. I lived that in my life, except that right after that, Black Lives Matter happened. So then everyone went crazy again. But yes, they did release that finding in addition. Thank you, Marcus Sherry. So bearing this in mind, bearing that we know that diversity and inclusion makes us more profitable, Here's another question. Are companies that work in agile ways better at diversity and inclusion than those who don't? Now guys, there is no real right answer here. I have not done a study. I have not found a thousand people to ask this question to, but I'm asking how you feel about it. Uh, I'm gonna launch another poll. Tell me what you think. I've just gone simple yes, no for this because if I put a maybe, uh, everyone might veer toward the maybe. I'm getting a great comment in from Geet already uh, about that difference between working in agile ways or working with an agile mindset, which is a really great shout. Uh, while I'm waiting for people to vote in the poll, a fee, I know that you work quite a lot with companies who work in agile ways or companies that have, uh, I'm going to go with work in agile ways, actually, yeah. for this one, Gita, because I think it really does matter. Um, what do you think, Fee? Have you noticed them having stronger diversity and inclusion than other companies? Not, not really, <laughs> no, not really. Um, if I oh, think I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. Uh, no, it's fine. Sorry, go on, go for it. No, uh, no, it's fine. I was just thinking back, so I worked um, with, you know, the IT teams that I've worked with that use Agile. Um, maybe started, you started to see obvious diverseness. Mm. Um, in the teams, but no, not, you know, not hugely diverse in, across many different kind of groups. Um, and then a couple of my clients that are smaller companies and definitely not, no. So I find this really interesting. By the way, guys, the poll is split straight down the middle. It's like a 50-50 split with half of us saying yes and half of us saying no. Like in terms of where I lean, I just want to tell uh, two quick stories. The first is that I was on an Agile HR panel a couple of weeks ago, and I was asked the same question. Do I think Agile companies are doing better when it comes to diversity and inclusion? And I really wanted to go in armed with the facts. 
So I put the question out to my network because I really wanted to share some positive stories at this event and have a chance to highlight people who were doing a good job. And so I asked on my Twitter, on my Insta, on my LinkedIn, and there were crickets, right? There was nothing. Uh, so to the point where I started panicking and I called up the organizers and I said, guys, if my answer is no, they aren't doing better. How am I going to get kicked off of this panel? Because I, I didn't have anything to share and I was a little bit worried, right? Um, and my second story in this space is that a month or so ago, I made a big decision to part ways with a company that I have worked with for many, many years because of their approach to Black Lives Matter and to diversity in general, right? Um, they are an agile consultancy and they do lots of training. They have offices in the US, so everything related to Black Lives Matter was happening on their doorstep. And they had zero response, which kind of freaked me out. So I raised it and then HR came back with a response that said, uh, we don't make political stances or make statements. And once I'd gotten that response, it told me every single thing that I needed to know about them. And I decided that I would literally never work for them again. Uh, I get around quite a bit, obviously, in terms of my training work. And sometimes I do see companies who are working in agile ways, who do have that agile mindset, who are so good at diversity and inclusion, but I'm not sure that I'm giving agile ways of working the credit for it. Uh, it's usually down to other things like the way that they come together and the respect that they have for each other and i'm not a hundred percent sure it's agile so it's mixed let me see what's happening in the chat so paul says agile approaches uh create more friction and conflict so biases can become more pronounced which i agree with uh scott is saying that COVID exacerbates inequalities which is also true and diversity makeups have been affected as well, right? Um, yes, right? So Gita echoing the same, that inclusions and agile can cause friction and conflict. And we need those. We need that discomfort to make the conflict healthy and get to the point where things would be able to change, which is a great perspective as well. Thank you so much, guys, for sharing. I already love how active people are being in the chat. And so the question is, if, if we're split 50-50 and we're like, okay, well, maybe agile companies aren't doing it the best as best that they could, how can we as a community make them better is the question. And so I want to talk about that today by thinking about products and thinking about people and teams. So inclusivity in products first, and then inclusivity in people and teams. And uh, I'm gonna talk about those both in turn. And I'm gonna talk about products first uh, because it's easier, <laughs> right? Um, now, when I talk about building inclusivity into products, lots of times I hear this. We can only afford to build for the majority, right? So we can only focus on the majority. Uh, and that means that sadly, some people like the poor little cartoon on the screen get left out while other people um, just completely are included and feel great about things. So let's talk about this whole minority majority thing. Because sometimes what we think is a minority actually is quite a considerable group, right? So let, let's go with this one. Disability, right? So how many people in the world does the World Bank, I use the World Bank study, say experience some form of disability? So give it your best guess. How many people in the world does the World Bank say experience some form of disability?
So 64% of you answered correctly. It is indeed 1 billion people. I mean, yes, I get that it's a minority when compared to 7.7 .7 billion, but that is quite a considerable group. That is a bloody big group, right? And we can't afford to leave them by the wayside and not have them considered, right? Uh, in addition, let's talk about age now. So this time I'm using the United Nations study instead of uh, the World Bank's just because it's more recent. And so the new question is, uh, in 2019, what was the UN's estimate for how, what percentage of the population was over 65? Okay, so guys, the answer is actually 9%. So 9% of the world's population was over 65, estimated to be over 65 in 2019. What that works out to be is 703 million people. That is a hell of a lot of people, right, to be not considering. Because Marco is absolutely right. If a website is easy to use for the visual and visually impaired, it is also easier for the people to use who have uh, no impairment. And that is literally uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. Just so you know as well, guys, there are approximately 1.3 billion Black people in the world. So these minorities that we talk about are quite significant. So inclusive design, as Marco is saying, is actually really important. Inclusive design says that if you build products, systems, and environment to be designed by as many people as possible, regardless of their disability, age, gender, etc., you are building the best products. So if you make things accessible for a group that needs it, you automatically make things easier and uh, better for everyone. And I really, really do think that it's true. Uh, I wanna share now some examples of product enhancements that have been made with particular groups in mind that benefited the wider population as a whole. Just as some examples to how we can all do better as we build products and conceive of products. But before I do, Fee, can you think of anything that might fit the bill here? So what I'm asking about is like a product enhancement that was made with a minority kind of out group in mind, but now actually benefits the wider population. Yeah, for sure. I think for me, what comes out straight away is subtitling videos. Yeah. Um, and there's something about, because it has many benefits. It has benefits to people who are hard of hearing or deaf. Um, but also if you're maybe, it's an easy way to watch a video, isn't it? If you're in like a sound sensitive environment, like an office or a library or on the train commuting or something like that. Um, but also that's, it provides a better experience for people with learning disabilities and autism to have the words up on the screen. I agree with you, Fee. And I'm going to confess, I'm like a caption queen, right? Um, I always have the captions on. I find it comforting in a way to be able to read and not miss anything. So that is a great, great uh, example of inclusive design, right? And Fee, I am actually gonna steal that for next time because it didn't make my slide deck this time, but I think it is a, a really good example, right? So some others that stand out for me uh, like these easy open envelopes, which I absolutely love. You know, the ones where you just have to like pull the little tab and then the whole thing opens out really easily. Those are cool. It's for people who have uh, difficulties with their mobility, able to, able to open things. Uh, but I love them. They work for me. 
And I mean, this is really basic because now if you think about packaging, things have gotten so much better over time, right? I mean, when this is Xbox, uh, this is from their adaptive controller launch when they launched it. I mean, disabled gamers went crazy when they launched this because actually in the box, there was no plastic wrapping, there were no twist ties, and there were four different ways to open it, including just shaking it out. So there was a thing where you could pull it and then it popped out. There was a slide out tray. I mean, the packaging was like a bloody piece of artistry because of how closely they worked with disabled gamers to be able to test this. My husband works for PlayStation and they are still angry about this. They're still always talking about it. So it will be interesting to see what they come up with next in the space uh, that can compete, right? Um, moving on from packaging, this is like the little screen from a Kindle. Uh, I love a Kindle, uh, but I think the feature is available in other e-readers as well. I love e-readers in general because guys, if you want to read Fifty Shades of Grey or anything really dirty on the tube and you have an e-reader, no one knows that you're reading the smut and the filth on your way into work. It's amazing right? But also amazing because of this little game changer where you can, um, <laughs> oh my goodness. I just had a glance at the chat and Scott has written in that audio books are much better for the smut. So I'm, I'm having a little bit of a giggle. <laughs> Whoever is reading the chat at the end of this is gonna, uh, have a time. Um, so what a game changer to be able to change your fonts, to adjust your margins, uh, to change your line spacing. I use these features myself and this wasn't uh, specifically made for me, right? Now, guys, what are the fonts that are good for people who uh, have visual impairments? Any guesses? The good, yeah, we got there. I already knows where we're going. The sensory fonts are good. And I used to work for the Royal National Institute for Blind People, Dana, and there's definitely yeah. something about having fonts that are clear, that yes. shape, shape well, and that are also, you know, if you're going to go the size, make it slightly larger. So 14 up is really accessible. That is very cool. Gita has said the answer uh, that uh, always makes me smile, which is Comic Sans, right? Everyone makes fun of Comic Sans, but actually it's really good for visual impairments because the letters are easy to focus on and look unique. But like Ariel, Vedana, Tahoma, any sensory versions of fonts are good. And this is like a really simple change that everyone can implement when they're, they're building something that's online. And Gita says she thinks it's fun, but there are all these jokes you see on the internet with people wanting to fire someone off the island if they even think about using Comic Sans or anything. So that always uh, makes me smile as well. So moving on to easy feel product guides. So guys, these are bottles of herbal essences that I use to wash my hair with. Picture this, you're in the shower, you're shampooing your hair, your eyes are closed because you don't want the shampoo and the conditioner to go into your eyes. You're reaching out, you're feeling for stuff, feeling around, you don't know what you're holding in your hand. Herbal essences, bottles, now have uh, these little, so shampoos have lines on them and conditioners have little circles on them. Uh, they're called tactile markers. And so you will immediately know if you're holding a bottle of shampoo or a bottle of conditioner. And that is really important guys, because I have another quiz for you. Let's see how we do on this one. What percentage of visually impaired people know Braille? What percentage? We're having furious voting. Okay, I'm ending the poll. 
Uh, the majority of people went for 44 percent, but the uh, sorry went for 17 percent. 44 percent of you did, but the answer is actually seven percent. So only 7% of the visually impaired population knows Braille and actually less and less children are being taught it now. So that is going to decrease and decrease. So tactile markers are actually becoming more important. And I will admit the first time I felt that on herbal essences, I was like, what the hell is this? And I had to go and look it up. But I actually think it is a really, really useful feature. And so finally, um, no, second to finally, guys, all of this uh, voice recordings and voice notes, uh, also talk to text and text to talk are not really for us, but I mean, how amazing are they? So I have literally stopped proofreading now and I do text to voice because I find like I don't always pick up errors while I'm reading, but if I hear them, I do pick them up. So that's my way of proofreading. Plus guys, I'm a twin mom. And sometimes that means that both hands are like occupied at the same time. And so all of those things where you can voice record, etc., uh, are really useful to me, right? Even though uh, this wasn't necessarily built with me in mind. Right. Um, those are good, but my favorite, and you guys are going to have to bear with me on this one. If you're hearing a little bit of an accent, I am from Trinidad in the Caribbean uh, originally. And let me just put it this way gently. The internet connectivity there is not the same as it is here in London. So lots of times when I am home, I'm like looking up something and the whole page doesn't load and images and videos and that kind of stuff isn't happening. And alt text and more specifically, the little captions that form part of the alt text really save me because they give me the spirit of what it is that I am looking at to make things easier for me to understand, right? Um, let me just go to the chat really quickly to see what I've missed. So Sylvia just chimed in that the contrast between the font and the background is really important, uh, which I totally agree with. Anne's put a link in there to some stuff about accessibility, which I hope ever, I'm scared to click it now because my amazing setup uh, will run away. Uh, yeah, that stat was scary and quite astonishing. So Marco was saying uh, that it might be because everyone, they think everyone has access to tech, such as tech, uh, text to talk. And Sylvia saying that maybe the rise of audio books has contributed to that as well. Great note uh, from Paul saying there's a persistent school of thought that for children with disabilities, it's better to teach them to function as much as possible without accommodation. And so I have a friend uh, who has a child who is disabled and that is completely her school of thought. So her aim is to make uh, Paul Abel, his name is Paul as well, Paul, uh, to function in the real world as much as possible, as much as he can, which is a great reason why the use of Braille is on the decline. So uh, Scott is talking about the Be More Pirate meetup, and all of us said the audio book was great. Yeah, uh, it proved that dyslexics make good pirates. Okay. So yeah, audiobooks, amazing for people who are dyslexic. What a game changer. That's awesome. Okay, guys, next I'm going to change tack a little bit and just talk about people and teams. Uh, just think in your mind about how you can maybe use some of the things that we talked about to make your product design more inclusive, including the link that was just pasted in the chat. Okay, so now on to people. And every time I come to talk about people in teams, I am reminded of this quote that I saw that I feel in my core, in my whole spirit. And it says this, the opposite 
of belonging is fitting in. And this is so true because if you have to work to fit in, it means that a part of you knows that you don't truly belong, that there is something about you that is different. The act of fitting in means that you have to code switch or speak a different way or represent yourself differently to use the language of the in-group, right? You have to mute a little bit of yourself. You have to look out for stereotype threats and try and combat against them. You might even have to battle some microaggressions in the workplace. And while you're doing that, the people who are in the in-group, they don't have to. So they have more of their mental capacity to be able to use on the job. They can be more productive. They have more energy and bandwidth. Guys, fitting in is really hard work. And take it from someone who definitely, definitely knows about it. Because for a long time, uh, this is basically how I felt. Now, I'm going to share some stuff that's personal, but I always feel like I have to caveat a little bit before I share this sort of thing, because I know that every single person who's on here can go on LinkedIn and see where it is that I worked. And my intention is not to slate them. They did amazing things for my career and I appreciate them. But this was in 2008, so 12 years have passed. And I think the things that I'm saying were maybe more representative of that time and hopefully things have moved on by now. I know that they for sure have moved in. They've been doing lots of work around listening. I've been part of that work and making changes to be better, but that doesn't negate the experiences that I want to share with you today. So I was working for Big Four and to be honest, guys, I always felt different working there. So in the cohort for my team in tech that I joined, there were 25 of us who started on the same day. And by the way, there were many other intakes of grads, but in mine, there were 25. And I was the only black person. And I didn't know that, but I really didn't feel any way about it because I figured, hey, you've moved to the UK. This is the new normal. You're in the minority now. Deal with it. And honestly, that first day was really the last time that I thought about color and race and ethnicity for the time that I was there. I never felt discriminated against because I was black, hand on heart, right? But I did feel discriminated against because I was a woman, right? It was very boys clubby there, major boys club. And I felt like there was no space for me or like I had to work really hard to carve out my space. So we were all really young. And so there was a massive drinking culture that I was just not into. This is what I was talking about at the start. Uh, but every social would happen in the pub. And then if you had a day at work or whatever, people were going to the club, even when there wasn't uh, a major social going on and everything was happening in the pub and I was just not a, a pub girl. That is not the way that we roll in Trinidad. So I just was uncomfortable with that. And so by not doing it, I then got completely left out of stuff because discussions about work and about stuff were happening in the pub and I wasn't there to be a part of those discussions. God, people, how much time can we spend in the pub? It was so frustrating to me in the beginning. And then I felt like lots of the bonding was about sport. And guys, I did not know anything about the Premier League. I only know about that now. I mean, I'm, we did have football. I'm sure people were watching football in China. I was not watching football in China. I had never even really known anything about rugby before I moved. And yeah, I'm Trinidadian, go West Indies, but I didn't watch any cricket either. Like I was so out of things. And so on, in all of the chats, again, I felt like I couldn't really contribute. Guys, I got so desperate at one point, and this is so cringe to admit this, I had my husband teach me about football and tell me like which team that I would like to be able to talk about something. And on a weekend, I'd be like, okay, let me watch the highlights so I can talk about something if something happens and try and be a, like a cool girl to, to fit in, which is, is a bit sad. 
That was a sketch. That was a sketch in the Big Bang. <laughs> what? <laughs> <Theory with Leonard. laughs> yeah, I mean, guys, it, it desperate times call for desperate measures and all of that, right? I also realized that I didn't see the world the same way as everyone else. So like my culture and my background kind of changed the ways that I thought about things. And sometimes I would speak up and say something and then I would get dismissed and told about like island things and island girl and island mentality and that kind of stuff, which, you know, hashtag banter, whatever, all the bants. But it made me really uncomfortable to kind of speak up and share my perspective, even when that perspective was valid. And so finally, I want to talk about the year that I was ready to get promoted to manager in the firm. So promotion to manager, there's like a whole manager panel and you have to do these tests and you have to do skills practices and you get formally assessed, but the assessment is done by people who are not on your team to make it as fair as possible. Uh, I felt like I was smart. I was capable. I had really good client feedback and I felt like I was a lot for this. And so I went to my partner and I was like, I'm ready. I want to put myself forward. And he said, this year, we really want these two people uh, who were both men to get promoted. We had not really identified you for promotion, but I am me. So I didn't just take it. And I was like, well, well, why? And he said, he thinks they have better experience than me. And I said, well, okay, maybe they do. Maybe they've been on better clients, but by the way, guys, there was total curry favoring for clients. Okay. So getting chosen for a client was also like, who do you know who thinks you're cool, who wants to hang out with you in whatever city in the middle of nowhere? And so I said to him, okay, fine, but does that mean that they're ready to step up and be leaders? And he was like, okay, Dana, if you're going to make a fuss about this. We will put you forward. Uh, but just be aware that I'm only putting you forward so that next year, when it's time for you to be promoted, you would have already had experience of what panel is like, and it will make it easier for you next year. You're, you're not going to make it through. And I was devastated. Yeah. Uh, but I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go through and get the experience, whatever I fought so hard for it. And then for the next three weeks, I had to watch as directors in our team prepared the other two people for their management panel, listening to their presentation, giving them tips, doing like Q&A run-throughs with them. And what did I get? I got absolutely nothing, like nothing. And my husband, he tells the story all of the time because he was living it with me. And in public at work, I had to pretend that I was unaffected by all of this that was happening because I was also scared of being labeled some emotional female who would therefore not be ready for promotion anyway and then excluding myself. So then I couldn't speak up. But behind closed doors, I was really upset. I had like mega meltdowns. And eventually, guys, a friend stepped in and rescued me and came over on a weekend, like the weekend before, to help me prepare and do like a little session. And I went in there and I freaking aced it, guys. One of those two guys didn't even make it in. He didn't even pass his panel because it was a panel that wasn't from our team, that didn't have the background and the history. So this panel that I wasn't ready for, I did the best of, of the three. And for me, that kind of like sums up my experience in tech at, at that firm. My point is this, like when we don't have diverse and inclusive teams, when people aren't empowered to step up, like bad things happen. And I don't think that to sound as a threat. Like if you don't do diversity, bad things are going to happen to you. I really mean bad things, right? So for example, guys, are you telling me that no one noticed that this was a little bit sexist, maybe? No? No? We're, we're just telling little girls to hate their thighs and yeah, that, that's, that's okay, right? To make it and also to stock it. Um, does anyone remember what this story is about? This is about those, the, the soap dispensers, the racist ones at Twitter HQ, 
that don't detect brown hands exactly guys how did no one spot this i guarantee they could have found a range it probably never even occurred to them to to test this okay the thing that i saw on twitter last week which had me rolling are you a doctor miss or are you a doctor missus and what does it matter if i'm a doctor i'm a doctor men don't get defined by their marital status and if what you want to know is my marital status then put it in a separate bloody checkbox what the hell is this i guarantee if they had shown that to a woman she would have said something i mean there is no way that this would have passed right <laughs> This sandwich, I love m and but who thought that this was a good idea? Like, like who thought, who, who, who thought this? Like, why? I mean, if you're going for the LGB, it doesn't, I mean, cute guys, but no, like run it past someone. The funny thing about this is if you go to their original Instagram where this is posted, um, there is the top comment and it's got loads of likes on it just says no in capital letters n o no uh yeah but it's still up there or or these <laughs> like did did you even try to get any who is getting a wheelchair up that bloody thing on the left it just isn't gonna happen right it's not gonna happen so what do I need from you as a result of this? We basically need people who are in in-groups. And at some point in time, we are all in in-groups, right? But when you are in an in-group, you need to step up and be a superhero and an ally for the people who are in the out-groups, right? I have had so many people step up for me as a woman in tech. So there is uh, a lovely guy who I work with quite a lot as co-facilitators. And literally every time we do a course together, we have similar qualifications, but I have more experience than him. All the questions go to him. Like, like every single time he gets all the questions because he's the man and he is obviously the authority in the room. But he does this lovely thing, which is Dana can actually tell you a really good story about this. Or Dana has some pretty good experience of that. She can tell you about it. But he pretty much has to do it in every freaking session uh, that we have. Fee, I haven't chatted to you in a bit. Have you ever had an ally at work? Yes, I have. So, um... The gentleman that always comes to mind is as somebody who's quite senior in the learning and development industry, big conference speaker, conference organizer. And I was chatting to him a couple of years ago about my confidence for speaking around my confidence for speaking at events. And um, we started chatting and we set up some kind of little short informal mentoring sessions. And then he kind of helped me build up my confidence um, to speak in front of larger groups and he also thought about you know giving me opportunities to practice and then gave me a couple of speaking opportunities that's awesome fee yeah. thank you so much for sharing guys the reason why we need to step up for other groups is because of something that's called complainer syndrome right complainer syndrome says that if I speak up about something that relates to me, then I am less likely to be heard about that thing because I'm directly affected. So it gets discounted, right? Uh, but if someone who isn't affected speaks up, that point, that perspective is given more credibility, which is messed up, but fine. We know about it. Let's play to it, right? So for example, if something affects someone who is gay, I'm straight and I speak up, that thing has more weight, right? But if the issue affects black people, it's going to be more powerful if B speaks up. And if the issue is one affecting women, then it's better if Jeff or Adrian or someone else who is male steps up to speak, right? And Gita saying it is exhausting to be the one to speak up all the time. It is, and it actually feels easier to speak on behalf of other people than to speak up 
on your own subject constantly all of the time, right? It is exhausting. And sometimes some of the frustration that you feel about this comes across more when you're talking for yourself. But when you're talking about for others, it's possible for you to be more measured and as a result, even more persuasive. So I am asking us to step up today. And there are loads of ways to step up, but I am focusing just on four for today. The first thing is leading by example. Okay, so by leading by example, what I mean is if you see things uh, that aren't right, or if you, you are the person who is constantly suggesting things, people will pick things up from you. So if you are always suggesting ways to make things inclusive, or if you are constantly the one thinking, how are we going to make this more inclusive? People are actually going to start thinking about it without you having to voice it every single time, right? So lead by example, be that champion and be consistent about it, right? The second thing is challenge with questions. And I think this is really important because people are like, oh, I don't want to muddy the waters. I don't want to create conflict. Guys, firstly, sometimes conflict is healthy, but there is a great way to be able to tackle things head on that has been proven to work. And I want to share it with you today. And it's about using questions. So when I finally became a manager and I was going into consistency meetings and appraisal meetings, I would hear things in the meetings like, I'm not sure that she's really committed, which means something like she just got married or she might be thinking about having a child. And that's the way they would phrase that. I'm not sure she's really committed. And instead of saying, oh my God, what are you, right? Which I felt inside, I would say, Fiona, why don't you tell me a little bit more about that? How do you feel about that? Why do you feel that way? Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And they have two options. Either expose themselves for what they really are or start talking out loud and realize what they're saying and then backtrack. But either way, asking the questions really, really does work. Most times it would be like, oh, uh, yeah, scrap that or like whatever, when everyone knows what you mean. And I am sending a signal to every single other person in the room by asking that question that I am going to ask the question and it is going to feel uncomfortable. And yeah, you need to have an answer. I'm not letting you slide with the crap that you're trying to pull. So challenge with questions. A simple what do you mean by that? Or can you tell me more about that? Or can you tell me what you mean? Well placed, right? Next up, thank you, Gita, is about creating space for voices to be heard. And so what I mean by that is firstly what Gita is saying, which is if a man repeats what a woman says and the man all of a sudden gets heard and the woman said that, saying things like, oh, John, I love the way that you reframed what Jane said. Or for example, sometimes I would be talking and I felt like I was screaming into the wind, but then a director would say, actually, guys, can we pause for a second? Dana's saying something really amazing here and I want to make sure that you don't miss it. And then everyone would get quiet and I would have a chance finally to speak and be heard, right? So he was creating that space for me. Or things like, if you know it's harder for women or for people of color to get promoted, then boost their visibility by taking them to client meetings, showcasing their work, getting them to talk in advance so that people know more about them. And then my last one, and this one is for the Dana of 2008, is God, guys, can we please advocate for more inclusion? Like, do we always have to go to the pub? Yes, I'm back to that. Can we put socials that everyone can go to? Do things have to be overnight? Like, can some of the things be in the school day? Can we give people advance notice? Like, God, and can we take away that, like, punishment for not being there either directly or indirectly where things get 
talked about or discussed or you miss out by missing out because you have other commitments. Guys, the next time a social is being planned, I would love if some of you on here went, can we do something else or spoke up for someone or, or anything? I had a bit of a rant there. For you didn't even stop me from that rant, but that's okay. Uh, so I guess the point is, what now? What can you do to make your products and teams more inclusive? And we have a couple minutes left, so I would love it if you wrote some of your ideas into the chats. Oh, Antoinette is making me laugh that a person became a smoker to get in the zone. Now, that was a barrier I wasn't uh, willing to cross, but wow, sometimes we do get desperate, right? Scott's saying all the socials are on Zoom now, so it's good. But Scott, make sure they're at a time where really the majority of people can make them and not at time rando or clock, right? Uh, Sylvia is saying that there's a summer barbecue for everyone and their families. That's quite nice. So on to the points that you can do, things you can do to make your products and teams more inclusive. Uh, Paul's saying, rewrite your job ads and evaluate how you hire. And don't make a hire decision until you have a diverse candidate pool. I love that. <laughs> Gita is doing some self-promotion. And listen, Gita, I love it. She says, watch her talks on humanizing the workplace or being more vulnerable. Gita, I am not averse to some self-promotion. I actually quite love it, right? Anything else from you guys in the group? Small things you can do. It can be things like check the fonts, right? Or up your contrast. Yeah, Scott, have customer testing with diverse groups would be a good one. Use diverse personas. Stop using the word guys. And I am so guilty of that, but I've been trying to use folks more and more. Um, Juliana says, notice if you have adequate food for diverse guests because she's vegan. Some people may not eat meat or may not eat pork, etc. right? Right. Include vegan and vegetarian options. Love it. And make that the standard. Amazing, guys. Well, I guess that is the end. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening uh, and for all of your contributions. I hope that you got some food for thought from today's session. Uh, we are thinking a lot about diversity and inclusion everywhere. And so it's great to be able to speak about it in an agile conference. I was really chuffed when Jose asked. Uh, final notes from Scott, and it was sent before as well, which is don't get defensive if you get picked up for a diversity faux pas. And there is a temptation uh, to do that, right? And guys, a, a few weeks ago, even I got told that I might be showing a little bit of my privilege. And I really took that on board and reflected about it. So not, not getting defensive. Thank you, folks. Uh, that is pretty much the end because there's other stuff that is happening today. Uh, thank you so much for spending your time with me. Enjoy the rest of your conference and I will hopefully see you in Sokoko.